want our children taught in huge classes of up to 80 pupils. And has anybody got a club by any chance? We'll see a club from over here. If you've got a club, it looks a bit more like a shamrock. Or is the conventional wisdom that smaller is better? Eight, not 80, borne out by the evidence. How could we describe Cinderella's shoe? Let's have some hands up. Katie. The answer to the question, does class size matter, is, is at one level very straightforward. Yes, it does, with the youngest children in school. But there are significant practical, political and financial hurdles on the road to reducing class sizes and improving results and making teaching less stressful. Our estimates are that you get an extra something like two months learning per year if you reduce class size by 30%. And that'd be great to have if we could afford the extra money. Oh, and by the way, we're going to have to build an extra 150,000 classrooms. So the reason I don't advocate class size reduction is because I think there are better things we could do with the money. And this view is backed up by an authoritative worldwide research project, which places class size 106th in importance out of 138 factors affecting pupil achievement. And with enormous pressure on public spending, firm policy commitments to reduce class sizes are likely to be less visible on the political radar. So where is the debate headed? How do teachers feel about a subject so emotive that in the past it's led unions to the brink of strikes? And is it time to think radically? It cannot be that the answer is always 30 children. We can be more flexible than that. There are some things where each teacher is doing their star turn, if you like, where they could easily do that with 120 children, but then have follow-ups with 10 children. But according to another internationally respected expert in the field, the research does seem to support the conventional wisdom that smaller classes are effective in one area. A very clear result was that the children in the smaller classes made better progress than the children in the larger classes, particularly in the first two years of school, so in the reception year and year one. And it was a particularly marked result for the children who were initially lower attaining children in literacy. After that, uh, at the end of what we, you know, key stage one, at the end of the infant stage, um, the, res the results were not so straightforward and they didn't really show up thereafter. And that is very much in line with other research, particularly there's a big, big study in America. And they have a, a similar kind of result, really, which is that the biggest effects are in the early years. So if class size matters, it matters most in primary schools, according to the theorists. Do teachers agree? We asked two primary teachers to take part in an experiment. St John's Mosley Common Primary School in Manchester has classes of varying sizes. Year 3 teacher Andrea Heaton has a class of 18, whilst her colleague, Year 5 6 teacher Joanna Walker, teaches 28 pupils. We asked them to swap classes for one lesson and compare notes. I've taught class sizes below 20 for the last sort of two, three years, so obviously going into a larger class. I'll have to see, you know, the difference and see whether I can get round to them all. I'm not going to ask the children to move around as much. I'm going to have them sort of sat in the places and, and teach from the front more than carpet work and individual group work because of the nature of the setup of the classroom, I think it will be hard to do group work purely, again, for the space and the layout of the classroom. I haven't taught a class as small as Miss Heaton's for a, about 15 years now, so it will be quite interesting for me to see now what it's like to teach in a small class situation. Knowing that I had so much more space in the room, one of the activities that I'm going to do with the children is for the children physically to make themselves into a long number line. Now, I couldn't possibly do that in here. Enjoy. Enjoy yourself, Miss Heaton. Bonjour. When I say go, I want you to order your numbers. Make yourselves into a long number line. Good morning, year five and six. Good morning, Miss Heaton. So, first activity I want you to do is can you write three things on your whiteboard that you know about a biography? Hello. Oh, How was well, that? 
That was great. Very, very different mm. than being in my class. In what way? So I purposely planned a get up and go activity yes. because the children do like to get up and go and be actively involved. Oh, oh who's got the go? smallest number? Yeah. Smallest number has to be down yeah. here. And it was very easy for me to pick up straight away on children that were confused, or children that had done it wrong, or children that were in the wrong place on the number line. That was what I'd planned yes. for, to, for them to be able to make themselves into a number line. There's not a chance of me being able to do it with 28 children in my no. class, because there just isn't the room. OK, those of you who were writing the CV for Charlotte Bronte, how did we find it? And it's getting round the children. One child at one end put the hand up and it was with you in a minute. I'll get back to you That's in a moment. Right. And you're physically, you know, manoeuvring between the, the tables That's and right. chairs, chair legs, table. Right. Check your spelling of Bronte. Check your spelling, especially when you're copying from information. Because I found it was absolutely brilliant being able to give such quick feedback mm. to children. Yes. Because I was able to get round them quickly uh, because there were ten less of them. Yes. So I was able to give children that needed support the support quickly mm. and I was able to give feedback to other children and just basically know exactly what everybody was doing and where they were up to and the problems that they were having. Yes. And mark as I went along. Yes. Because um, I normally have... 28 books uh, to yes, mark. Yes, I now have a big pile of marking mm. to do. An extra 10 mm. books. Thank you very much. They are heavy, Jamila. Lots of books then. Our small-scale experiment seems to fit the accepted view. Teachers generally prefer smaller class sizes. And the head teacher of this primary school continues to prioritise this ambition. They would hate to lose the fact that the class sizes uh, are small, just to be big for the sake of being big. Financially, it'd be great for me, make my life so much easier. But it's for the children, so it's not about making my job easier, but it's about what's best for the children. And the staff are, are quite passionate about the fact that the children get the most from a small class. Too small, uh, I'd say below 15, and it, the dynamics don't work as well. But about 20, uh, 22, which is our standard numbers, then that tends to work very well. This primary has smaller class sizes than most. In the UK, we have the biggest primary class sizes of almost any developed country, an average of 26 pupils. There's a cap of 30 pupils per class in Key Stage 1. But what's the perfect number? Particularly in the States, there has been a strong view that below 20 in a class is important. Unfortunately, that's got a lot to do with the research that's been done in the States, where they compare class sizes of about 17 with class sizes of about 23, 24, 25. So the midpoint between those is conveniently 20. Our research suggests that reductions in class sizes can have beneficial effects, and there's not an obvious point when it, it sort of knocks in or knocks out. If the academic research on the optimum number of pupils in a class is inconclusive, the same cannot be said for how teachers feel. They are unambiguous, not about any magic perfect number, but about the simple contention that smaller is better. In 2009, we carried out a survey of over 1,000 ATL members to find out what they thought about class sizes. 96% of them said that they felt there should be a maximum class size limit for all classes across primary and secondary. About three quarters of them felt that bigger classes had a negative effect on their stress levels. Many of them also believed that larger classes had a, a large impact on pupils' ability to make relationships with staff and staff with pupils, meaning that it makes it much more difficult for, for staff to provide individual support for pupils and to provide personalised learning for those pupils. Despite this commonly held view, some academics argue that big classes can and do work, but it means doing things differently. What my research suggests is that we should be focusing on teacher professional development, a relentless focus on making every teacher realise that they have to get better. Not because they're not good enough, but because they can be even better. I think we should give serious thought to actually having larger classes rather than smaller ones, but giving teachers much less contact time. The average English teacher, teacher in England, is in front of kids about 1,100 hours per year. 
In many Japanese schools, they have classes of 40, but they're only in front of kids 550 hours per year, half as much. And the rest of the time, they're working with their colleagues, trying to come up with better ways to teach. No one is saying that you can't have really good teaching in, in large groups and large classes. If we've learned one thing from research on class size is, you know, it's encouraging the adaptability of teachers to the context. And for too long, really, we've not thought about the importance of these contextual factors. We've rather assumed it's just about teaching and it's just about learning. But, you know, we do respond to the context we're in. So if in schools we're thinking very intelligently about how to use different sizes of classes um, for particular teaching purposes, that's fine. And experimenting with class sizes to make the best use of the best teachers was exactly what the management of Sydney Smith School in Hull began to do in 2007. The school in a socially deprived area was in special measures. The teaching of English and maths were identified as areas of great concern. The solution was radical. Walls were demolished and two classrooms, each designed for 30 students, became one, holding 60. You've got a slip of paper on your desk, white paper. It's got a set of axes like they are on the board. All I want you to do with that is plot the points that are shown on the board. It's a very basic task. See how you cope with it. I suppose it was a combination of two things. The first one was that we did have a shortage of teachers in English and maths. But the second thing was it was about trying to maximise the number of students who could actually be taught by the, the outstanding and good and outstanding teachers in the school. And this was one way to do it. We've tended to aim it at the higher ability students. The lower ability students we still keep in smaller classes. The research on teacher quality shows that the quality of the teacher, how good that teacher is, is the single most important determinant of how much a child will learn. In the classrooms of the most effective teachers, children will learn twice as much as they do in the average classroom. And in the classrooms of the least effective teachers, children learn half as much. If the teacher quality is high, then I think we can start thinking about much more flexible ways of organising learning. That's exactly the approach taken at this school. English teacher Emma Bibby has been rated as outstanding by Ofsted. What I would now like you to do, please, is read their paragraph, and I would like you to tick or cross next to each of the assessment criteria as to whether or not they've included those features in their paragraph. If they have, tick it. If they haven't, cross it. All right? In terms of teaching the double classes, it's been great for me because you get into a, a habit of teaching the same lessons in the same way. Um, but obviously when you have 60 students in your class who all need to make progress, you have to change your teaching style. In terms of behaviour management, I'm fortunate enough to have developed enough skills over the years to be able to control most situations. Again, the students, because they're constantly on task, you know, focused in what they're doing, they don't have time to mess about, to be honest. Therefore, they present positive behaviour most of the time. You can see already how well you've done. All right, look at how many people are now getting a B. And you've still got two years before you finish your chances of sitting your exam. OK, so well done today. Round of applause. Let's go, American. Excellent. You're measuring height and arm, arm spans at the back there. Heights are in the middle. Once you've done your measurements, stuck them on there, you can sit back down and carry on. It's challenging because you've got obviously got a lot of kids to, to work with and you've got to make sure that they're, they can access the work at all levels. But at the end of the day, it's also rewarding because to see what they come out with at the end of it is absolutely superb. We've got some kids in here who have already got a grade C in the GCSE that were targeted less than that. Six foot three. Don't mess it up. No, watch the air, people. 182. 182? Yeah. So you are just under name. six foot. Oh, no. Critics will say that the brightest pupils being taught by the best teachers is almost bound to improve results. But the senior management team at Sydney Smith point out that the school is now out of special measures and the results continue to improve. The head teacher sees no reason why the double class experiment should not be extended to subjects other than maths and English. The impact so far has been very good. Um, initially, 
We had a number of concerns from some parents who were worried about students being lost in the big group, but the evidence is showing that they're actually getting more attention because as well as the outstanding teacher, we've managed to get two or three support staff in as well. And so it means the adult-student ratio is actually better than if it was in a normal classroom. Also, the results are showing that there's been big improvements, and in both maths and in English, that the students that have been taught by the good or outstanding teachers, they've shown better progress. To my mind, there's no reason why you couldn't do it in any of the academic subjects, such as history, geography, all those sorts of subjects. Anything practical-based, design technology, science, it would be more difficult, I would think. But I see no reason why other subjects shouldn't be part of having larger class sizes. What makes a good story? You all know the answers to this, so really, really quickly, recap, let's go. What makes a good story? Ryan? Uh, lots of adjectives. Lots of adjectives, brilliant. Kellyanne? Make it your own. Make it your own, okay, so make it original. Luke? Plan it, absolutely. If you don't plan it, you don't get structure. How you At Sydney Smith, they took a low-tech approach to increasing class sizes by simply knocking down walls. At the new academies, huge classrooms are designed into the buildings. At John Cabot Academy in Bristol, they've just built a classroom which is able to accommodate 160 pupils. Two years ago we became an academy and in that time we had the opportunity then through some extra funding to build a new building, so we built a new building. And our aspiration then was to comfortably be able to house in one place, on one level, around 80 students. So therefore now we, we do teach students 80 at a time. Similarly in the downstairs of that area we can house 80 in an assembly style arrangement. Actually speaking we can house 160 in there but it's a bit tighter at that point. The real positive in that situation is that it's, it's personalised learning but it's happening in, by using space. And so if a student's ready to move on and they're ready to move on, and if that means they need to go to a different area to either to access a different piece of machinery or equipment or computer or a different member of staff, any resource, we don't want the way that we've organised space and put walls up to be a barrier to that progress. In this year's seven class, 80 students are led by three teachers and four other adults. You should all have a playing card in your hand. You need not to lose your playing cards for today. If you haven't got one, put your hand up. Fantastic. Our competency focus for this week is teamwork. And today is your last lesson on project one. So this is your last time to collect some evidence to show us that you're getting better at teamwork. I become much more of a f facilitator. And the intention is that with the flexible space, Rather than just having three different activities that the students can take part in, which would happen in the traditional model with three classrooms, there could be five or six different activities going on here. So there can be small groups working together in, in the breakout rooms. There could be a large group having a seminar with a member of staff, maybe about one aspect of Bristol. There could be a small group working with a teacher recording a radio programme, but that teacher's then got oversight of another 20 students who are working independently on the computers. So the sole intention was personalisation and allowing the students to develop as independent learners. Right, guys, you need to decide at least four things, OK, and then you're going to vote on them. We all need to listen to one another's ideas, this is what effective teamwork is, OK? Then you can come up with the idea. I think it's better to be in a bigger class because then you can make more friends. Hold it. I'll tell you when, all right? Yeah, but Connor, hold it to your mouth. <laughs> Thank you. Go. Hello and welcome to Heart. Tonight our top stories are all about Bristol. I like the smaller class, really, because it's more quiet and more peaceful and you don't get much distraction. Upstairs, right, is some big and you've got like one class talking and the other class talking. And if you're closer to like the other class, you ain't getting, you're getting like a bit of information from both sides, so you're getting a bit of like from the other side and a bit from the other. It's like a bit confusing sometimes. The most popular schools in Bristol that many people should know of are John Cabot Academy, um, Mangotsville and Down End. Back over to Connor. Thank you, Ben. Now, the most weirdest news about, ever about Bristol. Cue music. It takes time for the students to get used to it, but it takes, it takes time and skill for the teachers to get used to it. We have tried with some of our very skilled teachers to bring them over here, and they've tried to bring their style of teaching 
into this big open plan space and it hasn't necessarily worked. You get used as a teacher to having your specific group of students that you're responsible for and all of a sudden now we're sharing students. You have to let go of some of the control of your classroom and you have to be prepared to work together with other colleagues who might have different ways of controlling noise and they might have different tolerances. Just put your hand up and tell me what was the little story that I read to you halfway through this morning? Who were the four characters in that story? George. Everybody, somebody, nobody and... Uh, Last one begins with A. Anybody. Good, excellent. If over a period of time it starts to save money, that's got to be good because I'll reuse that money. But the notion of saving money implies it just goes into somebody's pocket and that's not how it works. So if, if we are funded less, I have less to use, I have a way that I can possibly get through that period. But it's never about, that's great, we've just saved 50,000 pounds, so now we'll all have treats for the year. The drive is to improve teaching and learning. If you plan well, this model of teaching could reduce your workload. I could teach the same lesson for three weeks on a carousel because I'm teaching three different groups of students. We've had to find a creative model for assessing, so we don't use bookmarking traditionally a lot. We have a lots of self-assessment and peer assessment. If you think about the, the teaching experience is made so much better by working with other colleagues, all of the positive benefits and the buzz you get from that makes for a more creative way then of working. Rather than worrying about workload, um, we actually have to tell people to, to spend less time you know, staying up late at night planning exciting things because they get so enthusiastic about making their practice better. It's a very different way of teaching, but still relatively rare. What isn't rare, however, are reports of stress amongst teachers. That leads to difficulties in recruitment and retention, and the most common factor cited by teachers leaving state education for the private sector is the attractiveness of the smaller class sizes they find there. Sue Meadows made the move. The big question this morning. We looked at the five Ps last week. Can anybody remember what they were? Your hand will help you. Ooh, lots of hands up. Good. A major factor of my decision-making process for coming back into the independent sector was um, the fact that it is possible, I think, to perhaps engage a lot more with the students on a more individual basis when you have much smaller class sizes. So, for example, um, one of the state schools that I taught in, I had a top set GCSE class with 37 students in. And now I have a top set year 10 GCSE class with 17 students in. And that has to have an impact on the amount of time I can spend with each individual student, the amount of time and energy I can put into working on their coursework with them, into marking their work and giving very structured individual feedback. So it, it really makes a huge difference. So, if there's nouns with adjectives, what does that make it? Um, expanding noun. Brilliant, well done. You didn't say that very confidently, but you were absolutely right. Well done. If you're a good teacher, yes, you can teach a large class. But we don't always do things because we can. We do things because we want to. Um, and in terms of day in, day out enjoyment of the job, which 10 years in is a pretty important factor because I plan to be doing this kind of job for the rest of my professional career because I love it. Can anybody think of a more exciting word than big? Enormous. 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 Gigantic. That's good. Gigantic. Fantastic. These are miles better, aren't they? It's not just a question of proving to oneself that one can do all of these different things. It's doing what you enjoy, what you know is making a really huge positive difference to the students. And the idea of a smaller class, or at least not one numbering 60 or 80, as a community, which is more beneficial to its members, is reflected in the research. There is a bit of a, a current of view that there is something particularly important about the size of the class. And although you might think if you sort of, you know, double up the class and have twice as many staff, so the pupil-teacher ratios, if you like, are comparable to having, say, 30 in a class and one teacher, particularly some American research, particularly with the youngest children, suggests that the smaller class generates a kind of a certain kind of community which would be completely absent if you had 60 in a class with two teachers. We, as a school, enjoy and promote the fact that we've got small classes. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to combine classes, which then make them slightly larger. 
Now the challenge for us as a school is to do with how we can actually manage the small classes uh, with the budgetary constraints that that gives us. Now the challenge is also staffing it because as I've asked the staff so many times, would you rather have a big class and lots of teaching assistants or a small class with fewer teaching assistants? The teachers have always come back saying they'd rather have a small class and fewer teaching assistants. We are in a tough area. Um, Hull itself is a tough area and, and West Hull is no different to that. Um, but we have made it work and I think that this could work in all parts of the country uh, provided you've got the staff who are passionate enough to make it work and the teachers are a good enough quality. If we stand still, we've actually gone backwards. So this is, this is about us realising that the world that the, the young people are going into has changed in needs and we need to make sure that our, our schools are, are not in a different age. But when they come into schools, we aren't just keeping up, but we're actually leading the way. So, does class size matter? The answer is a resounding yes. In the early years, smaller is better and very popular with teachers and parents. Later on, the findings are less clear. But the bigger question is perhaps how manipulating class sizes and teaching groups can lead to improvement in our schools. So the important question is not, does class size matter? The question is, is it the smartest thing we could do with the money and our attention? And the answer is overwhelmingly no. There are better things we can do with the money than reduce class size. And it's time we started trying to do them. I mean, my view about class size reduction is that it can be a very valuable tool as long as we also engage in you know, what, what are the best ways of teaching in different sizes of classes for different kind of purposes, for different subjects. Um, if we just, as it were, reduce class sizes across the board and expect good things to follow, it ain't going to happen. Yeah.